Okay, on behalf of the uh, Center for Middle East Studies here at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's event. Uh, this is Israel-Palestine week for the Center for Middle East Studies. We had a very successful uh, panel discussion a couple of days ago with Peter Beinart, and this is the second of three events dealing with uh, the question of Israel-Palestine in uh, different dimensions. Um, we're very honored to have Professor Rashid Khalidi here. I just want to announce that he will also be on a panel discussion with two of our faculty members at the Corbell School tomorrow at 12 noon in room C-150. If you happen to uh, be around, please join us for that event. There is going to be free, um, um, there's going to be some food offered, free pizza, and I always, and I always say that because that um, tends to increase the participation rate of, of our events when uh, students know that uh, free food is being offered. Um, it just so happens that there is a connection between Professor Khalidi and the University of Denver, and that connection is in the form of um, um, Professor Andrea Stanton, who was hired approximately, I think, three years ago in our Department of Religious Studies, uh, where she teaches courses on the Middle East and on the Islamic world. Uh, she's also a, um, an affiliate of our Center for Middle East Studies, and we thought it would be only appropriate for, um, for the student uh, to introduce um, uh, the professor. So I'll turn the floor over to, to Andrea. Yes, yeah, so once a student, always a student. So we'll see what he thinks of my introduction <laughs> at the end of this. But yes, thank you very much to everyone for joining us here tonight for this important talk. And also to the Center for Middle East Studies for making this event possible. I happen to have been Rashid's student, but um, it was the center from the inception who said, by the way, we really want to get Rashid Khalidi here. We're going to work on it. It may take a while. Um, and the center, as I think many of you know, effectively just passed the one-year mark of its soft launch, which was in October 2012. And in that very short time, it's done much to open up new terrain for discussions of Middle East issues on campus and to heighten the visibility of this important region to the broader Denver communities. And I think tonight's event is a very apt illustration of the important role that the center is playing. So yes, I am Andrea Stanton. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies, <clears throat> um, but at heart I am a historian, um, as my students know, who are often victimized by looking to the past before we look to the present. Um, and my focus is the modern Middle East, um, so consequently it is a great privilege to introduce tonight a scholar who helped train me <clears throat> um, as one of my PhD advisors, and much more importantly, as a world-renowned scholar and public intellectual, Rashid Khalidi. And his talk this evening is titled United States Mediation Between Israel and the Palestinians, the first time as tragedy, the second as farce, um, an uplifting title from where we will go. Um, I think as most of you here know, uh, Rashid is the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies in the Department of History at Columbia University. He has a doctorate from Oxford and an undergraduate degree from Yale. <clears throat> and at Columbia, he served for nearly a decade as the director of the Middle East Institute. <clears throat> While at Columbia, I should also note he was at the University of Chicago before that, and some of us are a little bit partisan in here, Danny, <clears throat> of his Chicago connections, but I'm focusing on the New York side. Um, so while at Columbia, he's also worked with other faculty to really raise the profile of Middle Eastern studies on campus. Um, he serves on the steering committee of Columbia's first global center, which opened in Amman, Jordan in 2009. And he's also part of the Center for Palestinian Stud Palestine Studies, which opened in January 2010. <clears throat> Outside DU, um, Rashid also serves as the editor of the Journal of Palestinian Palestine Studies, which is the flagship scholarly publication of the Institute for Palestine Studies, which marks its 50th anniversary this year. He's also a past president of the Middle East Studies Association, um, which is the preeminent professional organization for scholars working on the Middle East, and he has twice received Mesa's Albert Harani Award for the best book published each year. Um, despite these and other commitments, Rashid has maintained a truly prolific publishing schedule with nine books to his credit, which is roughly one every 3.5 years. <clears throat> so if you are publishing at a slower rate than that, 
feel suitably humbled. <clears throat> um, and of course, these books include the classics Under Siege, PLO Decision Making During the 1982 War, Palestinian Identity, The Construction of Modern National Consciousness, um, The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, and His Current Brokers of Deceit, How the United States Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East. I should say also, nor does he limit himself to books. Um, since 2000 alone, he has published more than 30 articles. Um, so in short, this is a man who works tirelessly, or perhaps ceaselessly, to advance the fields of historical scholarship on the Middle East in general, and on Palestine in particular, and whose similarly countless media appearances and press interviews suggest an equal commitment to advancing public knowledge of these issues as well. <clears throat> um, the Center for Middle East Studies mission includes, and I quote, making the best and brightest scholars, policymakers, and intellectuals from around the world available and accessible to the university community. And I I would say that by bringing Rashid Khalidi here, <clears throat> the center is certainly fulfilling that mission. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rashid Khalidi to speak. Thank you, Andrea, for that very generous introduction. Um, I think your average is off. It's not one every 3.5 years. I've been, I've been at this business for a very long time. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to... Uh, uh, Danny and, and uh, to all of you, actually, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is only my second time in Denver. Um, and uh, I forget how nice it is to get out of New York and to you know, go west, uh, or, or, or for that matter, to go west from the, the Midwest. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, my topic is pretty much summed up in my title. Uh, my topic is US mediation between Israel and the Palestinians. The first time is tragedy the second time as farce. Um, I come to this subject out of more than just an academic interest. I was myself involved in some of the negotiations I'll be talking about, those that took place in Madrid and Washington from 1991 until 1993. And so part of this is not just not purely academic. It is some, something that I've actually experienced uh, from within uh, the negotiating chamber. Um, and it's something that I followed since I was a kid. My father worked in the United Nations Secretariat in political and security council affairs. So some of the security council resolutions that I talk about are things that were passed when my father was actually sitting in the chamber. And in some cases, I was actually there in the visitors, you know, the place where the visitors sit, uh, watching deliberations back in the 60s. So these are things that I've been in, in some way actually directly engaged with and I have not just read about uh, in, in collections of documents. Um, as you all know, as we all know, for the last several months, Secretary of State Kerry and his Deputy Ambassador Martin Indyk have been engaged in mediating renewed negotiations between the PLO and Israel. The talks have been taking place in an information blackout, which is very unusual for all three of those sides. Stuff leaks in Washington, and it leaks in Israel, and it leaks in Ramallah, and not a lot has leaked out about this. Um, they're also taking place, these talks, amidst very low expectations of success on all sides. I have not read one optimistic article about them yet. And there was a piece in today's New York Times which was suitably pessimistic. Um, three reasons are usually given for the widespread pessimism about these talks. The first is that we're about to have a midterm election next November, a little more than a year from now. And that's going to make it impossible for anyone in Washington to focus attention on this problem from at the latest spring of 2014. As you know, in Washington, they cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. Some people would say they can neither walk nor chew gum, but that's another, another issue. Certainly, they can't pay attention to getting reelected uh, and deal with a major international issue at the same time. And that's going to be the situation facing us from sometime next year. The second reason that's usually given for pessimism about this topic, uh, about these negotiations, uh, is the weakness of the PLO and of the Palestinian Authority, headed by Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, and that is pessimism that's related to the deep divisions among Palestinians and uh, the skepticism among Palestinians about the possibilities of su success. Again, the, the New York Times article has a mention of, of how few people think these, are, these talks are going to work. The third reason is the uncompromising pro-settlement orientation of the current Israeli coalition government. It's probably the most pro-settler government 
of any since 1977, and they have been generally very pro-settler governments. So this is quite, uh, 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 quite, a, uh, quite, quite out there, this government on this issue. Um, and so all of these are reasons why people have said this is not, this is not likely to succeed. I agree that these are daunting obstacles to any agreement. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, put, put them down as reasons why this thing might not work. But I am going to suggest tonight that there are other deeper reasons to look very skeptically at the newest negotiations and at the much longer sequence of negotiations of which they are an inseparable part. These are negotiations taking place on the basis of a formula and on the basis of prior agreements which have a history. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that history tonight. And I think it's necessary to go back and examine some of the structural reasons why the United States has not succeeded in bringing about a settlement between Israel and the Palestinians in the 22 years since the Madrid Peace Conference convened in October of 1991. And indeed, in the 35 years since uh, President Carter brought President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin together in Camp David and produced the Camp David Accords of uh, 1978. That's before most of the students in this room were born, either 22 or 35, undergraduates, graduate students. So that's a very long time. Let me start by taking us back to 1991. Um, in preparation for that peace conference, I can tell you a story about how I got involved, but I'll, I'll leave that for question and answer if anybody's really interested. In preparations, for, as part of the preparations for the Mid Madrid Peace Conference in 1991, Secretary of State James Baker sent what were called letters of assurances to all of the parties. There was a letter of assurance to Israel, Jordan, Syria, and so on. Uh, the Palestinians got one of these letters. And the letter to the Palestinians represented a response by the US to some of the Palestinians' pressing concerns. Um, in this letter, Secretary Baker promised that the United States would oppose actions which were described as prejudicial or precedential to negotiations. And they specified uh, Israeli settlement activity as one of these, uh, as one of these uh, uh, actions. So pre precedential, meaning they would set a precedent. If allowed to continue, they would set a precedent. And prejudicial was something that was, that was going on that would, would make it impossible to actually have fruitful negotiations. So the United States assured the Palestinians as a means of getting them to the table that the United States would oppose such actions. Um, there were similar promises, incidentally, made to other parties. And all of these letters were made public. So while there were probably private understandings as well, each one of the letters of assurances was made public. And everybody knew what the United States was saying uh, to the other parties. Um, the letter also promised, and here I quote, that the United States will act as an honest broker, unquote. Similarly, two administrations later, these negotiations were still continuing under the Bush administration. And uh, during, uh, this was the Bush Jr. Uh, Secretary Baker worked for Bush Sr. We're now talking about Condoleezza Rice and George W. Bush's administration. Uh, uh, in, a, in a later round of these negotiations, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice in 2008 told the Palestinian delegation that she wanted to, quote, tell you what I think of your positions without hurting my role as an honest broker, as the honest broker, she said. Now, I would argue, and I argue in this book, Brokers of Deceit, that in Secretary Baker's letter of 1991 and in Secretary Rice's comments of 2008, both American secretaries of state were reiterating a myth, a central myth, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is that the United States serves as an honest broker between the two sides. Um, I try to show in this book that far from acting in, in such a fashion, for decades, the United States has behaved in a thoroughly one-sided way. In consequence, far from resolving the conflict, American policy has actually exacerbated it. It has made it worse. It has prolonged it. Now, this is one of many myths. There's another myth. And this myth, myth would have it that this is a conflict between two equals. We have the Palestinians. They have their authority. They've now proclaimed a state. And we have Israel, which is obviously a state and has been a state since 1948. They are near equals. Um, According to this way of seeing things, this is not a situation where one party is in occupation of the territory of the other, or one party is a victimizer and the other is a victim. There are simply two parties. There's a dispute between them. And all that needs to be done 
is to adjudicate uh, this dispute. And in fact, according to the second myth, if there's any victim in this conflict, it's not the Palestinians, it's Israel. Now, anybody who's actually been there, anybody who's actually spent some time in occupied Palestine, anybody who's actually spent 10 minutes at one of the checkpoints that you have to pass through to get from, say, Jerusalem to Ramallah, takes you an hour just to get through the checkpoint. It used to take you 20 minutes to get from Jerusalem to Ramallah. It takes you an hour and 20 minutes sometimes to get through Qalandia. Anybody who's actually been there, seen the settlements, seen the conditions, knows that this is a, a conflict not between two equals. This is a highly asymmetrical conflict. It's a conflict between a very powerful Israeli state, uh, one of the nuclear powers, a country with an extraordinarily advanced uh, military, a country with the highest level of technology in the world, uh, on a level with the United States, and at the level and in some respects more advanced even than European countries. A country which has a very large GDP per capita. It's one of the richest, one of the 20 or 30 richest countries in the world. Um, and it's a country that is fully supported by the greatest superpower in human history, our country. Um, on the other side, you don't have a state. There is no sovereign entity between the river and the sea besides the state of Israel. The only power that controls entry and exit is Israel, whether you go through Ben Gurion Airport or you go across the bridge. Uh, Air, sea, land, everything is controlled by one power. That's the definition of sovereignty, control. Israel controls it all. And the Palestinians who live there, many Palestinians don't. They are refugees living outside of what used to be mandatory Palestine. The Palestinians who live there, uh, or the ones who don't, have never enjoyed self-determination, and for a, a century almost have lived either under some form of alien rule, whether it was British colonial rule, or it was Jordanian or Egyptian rule, or Israeli occupation, or live dispersed in exile from their homeland. The point I'm trying to make is there's no symmetry here. This is not something where you come between, say, a Germany and a France, two powerful existing nation states. There's a nation state, and there's a people that's dispossessed and dispersed and under occupation. I argue in this book, and this is an argument that was very much sharpened by my colleague, uh, Jim Chandler of the English Department at the University of Chicago. I argue in this book that language has an enormous importance in the construction of these and other related myths about this conflict. Um, I quote George Orwell, who wrote, in, in fact, it's the epigraph to the, first, to the introduction to the book. Uh, I, I quote Orwell as saying, and I quote him now, that the slovenliness the slovenliness of our language makes it easier, easier for us to have foolish thoughts. If thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. In other words, if we use debased words, our thinking becomes debased. If we use words that don't mean what they should mean, peace, process, for example, then our whole train of thought becomes corrupt. The framing of this conflict using debased, basically dishonest terms like honest broker or, for that matter, peace process has masked the reality. And that is a reality of the complicity of a whole series of U.S. administrations in the maintenance of the status quo, which is one of the dominance of Israel over the Palestinians. And I argue, I've already said it, that this complicity between the United States and Israel has made the prospect of a just settlement of the conflict between these two peoples far less likely. And language has made a decisive contribution to this process by corrupting thought and cloaking the real nature of this outcome. Um, the complicity between these two countries is not a matter of opinion. Um, it turns out that it's grounded in a letter that was sent by President Ford to then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1975. And it is still the basis of US policy on the Palestine issue. In that letter, the United States agreed to, and I now quote, coordinate with Israel with a view to refraining from putting forth proposals that Israel would consider unsatisfactory. So in 1975, the United States committed itself solemnly in a secret letter of assurances to the Israeli Prime Minister from the US President never to put forward any proposal on Palestine, only on Palestine, that Israel would consider unsatisfactory. In other words, the United States could not propose anything of which Israel did not approve 
previously. And the United States has remained faithful to this commitment ever since, in the 38 years since this commitment was made. Logically, you would think that a commitment like this would disqualify the United States from the role of intermediary between the two sides. It did not, and it does not. Secretary Kerry is still acting as an honest broker. Um, if you think back to the last presidential campaign, or you think about the political rhetoric in this country, whether Vice President Biden or Senator McCain or anybody from one end of the political spectrum to the other, this is the actual basis of the idea that there should be no daylight between the American and Israeli positions. In fact, there has been daylight between American and Israeli positions on many issues, but not on this issue, where this letter, in fact, still uh, defines the relationship. It's the basis of what is called the no surprises doctrine. The United States shouldn't surprise Israel. If you go back to that letter, you see why. The United States cannot put forward anything uh, by uh, an American self-denying ordinance that would be considered unsatisfactory by Israel. And I would argue, obviously, that this is one reason the United States has not been a satisfactory mediator in this conflict. Now, let me stress that this does not mean that the United States has not been an effective mediator in other aspects of the Arab-Israeli conflict. If you look at what has happened since 1967, if you look at the war of attrition between Egypt and Israel and the ceasefire that was brought about in, in the late 60s, that was brought about in the summer uh, of, of 1970, if you look at the negotiations leading up to and during the 1973 war, and then the negotiations that followed for disengagement agreements between first Egypt and Israel, then Israel and Syria, if you look at the Camp David negotiations, if you look at the peace treaty of 1979, you will see that in every one of these, every one of these cases, the United States actually operated effectively to help resolve these conflicts, or at least to reduce their intensity. And in the case of the peace treaty, helped to bring about a treaty between Egypt and Israel, the major Arab protagonist and Israel in 1979. However, look carefully at these efforts. Look at the context in which they took place. They were centrally directed not only at diffusing uh, the conflict in the Middle East, but also at diffusing potential superpower conflict. The United States was not just acting because it liked the brown eyes of the Israelis and the Egyptians. It was acting because nuclear war was a possibility in 1973 between the US and the Soviet Union. It was acting also because it was working to establish US ascendancy in the Middle East over the USSR during the Cold War. These were vital objectives, avoiding superpower conflict, winning the Cold War against the Soviet Union in the Middle East. And the documentary record, which we now have in abundance for the 70s, uh, shows that the United States, in its diplomacy, was forceful and effective. Uh, and then it often paid very little attention to Israeli objections. In other words, there was no submitting of proposals to the Israelis beforehand. There was no Israeli veto on a proposal that the Israeli side felt was unsatisfactory in any one of the negotiations I mentioned uh, from the 60s up through the end of the 70s. By way of contrast, uh, there is no peace between Palestinians and Israelis, even though for 35 years the US has ostensibly been trying to achieve these aims under what I would call the Orwellian rubric of a peace process. This is not a process that has produced peace. If they've been doing it for 35 years, and it has not produced peace. It is not a peace process. It's a process. God knows. There are people who spent their whole careers in the State Department working on it. They've done very well for themselves. There are peace process industry processors uh, working in think tanks all over the United States. They've done very well for themselves. So it's a process. God knows. But it is certainly not a peace process. We would have had peace by now. Um, in order to understand the reasons for these failures, I think it's necessary. You can do it many ways. You can go back to Roosevelt. You can go back to the Ford letter that I cited. You can go back to these instances where the United States was effective in the Arab-Israeli conflict. I did it by going back to what I call three moments of clarity in the history of American policy, specifically on Palestine. Because I'm arguing that American policy on Palestine is actually different than American policy in the Middle East as a whole. And that whereas the United States has often acted effectively in service of its own interests or the interests of world peace or its Cold War interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arabs in Israel, on Palestine it has not. And these three moments were times when I argue the available documentary record allows us to see the full reality of how the United States has acted and why it has contributed to the continuation 
rather than the resolution of this conflict. What are these three moments? The first of them came in the late summer of 1982. This is the first moment I focus on in the book. At that time, it appeared to people in the Reagan administration, the new Secretary of State, George Shultz, the President, their advisors, that there was an opportunity here in the wake of this war to implement the Palestinian autonomy provisions of the 1978 Camp David Accords and to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli aspect of the Arab-Israeli conflict. You may or may not remember that those accords were negotiated between the, three, the two presidents and the Israeli Prime Minister, President Sadat, President Carter, Prime Minister Begin in Camp David, but they had never gone anywhere because uh, at Camp David, the Israeli Prime Minister had insisted and prevailed in insisting over the objections of both President Carter and President Sadat that these accords could not allow the Palestinians to have self-determination, could not allow them to have control over land and water, and would not, could not end Israeli settlement expansion. In other words, the accords were written such that Israel achieved its objectives in all of those regards. Begin insisted, in other words, in denying any real autonomy to the Palestinians in the so-called autonomy accord. So there were, and it's another Orwellian use of language. The Palestinians had no autonomy if, if these, would have had no autonomy if these accords had been implemented. Israel would have maintained control over everything of importance, security, water, land, continued settlement, so on and so forth. Um, and that was thanks to the obduracy of Prime Minister Begin and the weakness of Presidents Carter and Sadat in standing up to him. In 82, because Israel had just won this enormous victory, because the United States in its Cold War vision of the region felt that Soviet proxies like the PLO, the Lebanese Nationalist Movement, uh, the, the, the Syrian regime had all been defeated in Lebanon, this was an opportunity to push for uh, a revival of the autonomy provisions of the Camp David Accords. The PLO was, was leaving Beirut. This was the time to do it. And so uh, uh, on September 1st, 1982, the President gave a televised address in which he put forward uh, his new plan uh, for peace, uh, which reframed the Accords in a slightly more favorable way to the Palestinians. Um, it was actually one of my graduate students at Columbia who brought to my attention a recently declassified uh, CIA memo that was produced at this time, just before the Reagan plan was issued. The memo predicted that the President's attempt to reframe these autonomy accords of 78, slightly more favorable to the Palestinians, would be met by an absolute refusal on the part of Begin. He would not budge from his own narrow, reductive interpretation of the accords. And it's stated, and I'm now quoting the memo by an unnamed, see, it, it, the names are all redacted from the document as we have it. It says, I quote now, in Begin's view, these agreements, and it's now in quotes, guarantee that under no condition, quotes in the document, guarantee that under no condition can a Palestinian state be created. In practice, Begin has effectively ruled out any exercise of Palestinian self-determination except one that continued Israel's preeminent position in the West Bank. It's another Orwellian use of language. Self-determination, self-determination that continued Israel's preeminent position in the West Bank. This was all the CIA, this CIA analyst uh, argued that Begin would ever allow. What was the outcome? Begin held firm to his position as this analyst predicted that he would, and the president backed down. President Reagan refused, was unable to hold firm to his own peace plan, uh, and it died a silent and unmourned death. Uh, this wasn't the first time that American policymakers acquiesced in the Israeli position on Palestine, in spite of their misgivings. I, I just mentioned that Carter had done the same thing at Camp David in 78. It was not to be the last time. So this is the first moment. I could talk more about it. There's a whole there's a great deal more that could be said about this. The second set of events that I, I argue provides a moment of clarity uh, was the events that I myself participated in. This was the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations that started at Madrid and went on through 10 negotiating sessions in Washington, DC. We actually met in the State Department basement. That's where the negotiations took place. Um, and the confidential documents that were produced by the Palestinian delegation to these talks were 
almost entirely in my possession. I mean, all, all, all the people who served, like myself, as advisors to the Palestinian delegation had, as did all members of the delegation, we all had copies of the documents produced by the Palestinian side, the documents produced by the Israelis and presented to the Palestinians, the memos of our conversations with the Israelis, and memos of the Palestinian delegation's conversations with the American uh, uh, mediators. Um, I had access to these. I actually have put the ones that I quote on uh, that I quote in the book online, and anybody can consult them. Uh, if you're interested, I can tell you the website. Um, these documents expose the extraordinarily high degree of discrete coordination, I would argue, the complicity between the positions of the United States and Israel. Secretary Baker said the United States would serve as an honest broker. What we discovered was uh, that it wasn't serving as an honest broker. Um, these documents also expose the timidity of U.S. diplomats in refusing to go beyond what they mistakenly believed were Israeli red lines. Oh, the Israelis would never accept this, therefore we can't suggest it, because we're bound by this 1975. They didn't tell us this. That document wasn't known at the time. We now, I, we now have it. It actually was never mentioned by uh, Secretary Kissinger wrote three humongous volumes of memoirs, each is over a thousand pages. He's talked about almost every time he picked his nose <laughs> diplomatically. I mean, there's almost no important event that's not covered in those 3,300, 400 pages. He never mentions this memo once. Never once. It's on the Israeli Foreign Ministry website. It was the first time it was ever, ever published. Uh, and I don't think it is, I, I don't know if it's published in a, by our government. In any case, um, the, 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 the low point for us came in May 1993 in the second to last session of these negotiations when the two sides were deadlocked over the issue of jurisdiction, uh, which is a very important issue. And um, the United States finally said, well, we're only mediators. We never want to take active role, an active role in this. Uh, but uh, Dennis Ross said, we are going to put forward a bridging proposal to bridge between the deadlock between the Israeli position and the American position. We, were, we shouldn't have been but we were shocked that that bridging proposal was less forthcoming than the last Israeli position that had been communicated to the Palestinian side. In other words, the Israelis were more forthcoming than the Americans were. The Americans were, if you want, more Israeli than the Israelis, which is a pretty depressing conclusion to come, for, uh, come to. Uh, I thought that this might have just been our negotiations, but a whole series of documents about the negotiations of the 90s into the second Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, have been put online by the Guardian at Al Jazeera. And if you look at them, you'll see uh, uh, that in the 2006 Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, there was a similar case of American mediators being more Israeli than the Israelis themselves. The Palestinians complained, but the Israelis have, been, have put forward a much more forthcoming proposal than you yourselves are putting forward. Another fact feature that emerges from the negotiations that we took part in was, and, and, and from the Oslo Accords that were signed elsewhere and by a different group of people, different group of Israeli negotiators, different group of Palestinian negotiators than the ones who met in Washington. Another feature that emerges from all of these negotiations of the 1990s is the remarkable continuity over multiple Israeli governments in the Israeli position on what they would allow in terms of Palestinian autonomy. Um, this essentially remained unchanged from the days of Begin, through the days of Shamir, through even the days of Yitzhak Rabin. Now, Rabin made many changes in the Israeli position. He accepted to negotiate directly with the PLO. He accepted that the PLO represented the Palestinian people. Uh, he accepted uh, that the PLO leadership and a large body of PLO cadres and military men uh, would be allowed to return to the occupied territories. These are enormously important changes in the Israeli position. But as far as what would be allowed to the Palestinians, uh, the core positions of his government, previous governments, and subsequent governments uh, have not really changed fundamentally. All of them have said Israel must retain ultimate security control. The, the Netanyahu government is reported in what reports come out, uh, and every previous government has argued Israel has to maintain control over the Jordan River Valley. Well, if you control the Jordan River Valley, you control entry and exit into the West Bank. You control the West Bank. You are not talking about sovereignty. You are not talking about statehood. You are not talking about self-determination. In fact, you're not really talking about, quote unquote, full autonomy. So this is something that actually has not changed in the Israeli position, uh, nor has an insistence on continuing settlements. Even Rabin, whose government was one of the few to cut funding to the settlements, never stopped the expansion 
of the settlement ed enterprise, nor has any Israeli prime minister um, since the beginning. Um, the book shows not only that there was this Israeli continuity, the book shows that American policymakers acquiesced, sometimes with misgivings, in these Israeli positions over several decades. So that's the second moment, these negotiations of the 1990s. The third moment that I examine in this book took place during the last two years of President Obama's first administration, which ended with the 2008 elections. Over this period, the President faced relentless pressure over the issue of Palestine, not only from Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also from the Republican leadership in Congress, and also from the Israel lobby and its supporters on Capitol Hill. This tripartite pressure eventually forced the president into humiliating retreats from the positions that he had staked out on a settlement freeze. He insisted that there be a freeze of settlements before negotiations could resume. On the question of the, the lines for the future borders, he said the 67 lines should be the basis for future borders between Israel and Palestine. And on the urgent need for a Palestinian state, he said there should be a state within a year. On all of these issues, which incidentally had been staked out previously by earlier US presidents, Obama was ab obliged eventually to back down and to abandon them under this tripartite pressure. From that moment on, in the second, third, and fourth years of his first administration, and really until Secretary Kerry started these recent negotiations, it wasn't the question of Palestine, where the president wanted to focus, that was the subject of exchanges between the Israeli and American governments. It was rather, Israel's, uh, rather Iran's nuclear program, which is what Netanyahu wanted to talk about. Uh, I, I have a whole chapter of the book that's devoted to that. I won't go into this. If there are any questions, I can, I can go into some more detail about this. I think these are three moments of clarity because they provide a clear sense of positions that you really don't hear clearly described in most writing on this subject. Um, in that writing, I, I would suggest corrupt, deceitful language, to use Orwell's terms, has played a crucial role. They have been talking about a peace process now for over three decades. And talk about this so-called peace process has in fact obscured the fact that the process the US was championing did not achieve peace, was not in fact directed at achieving peace. If what you mean by peace is a, 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 a treaty between two fully independent, viable, contiguous states living side by side that would bring the conflict between the two peoples to a final conclusion. If you were going to do that, if that was really your objective, one of the things you would say is there's this terrible occupation. It has to be ended. It's been going on for over two generations. It has to be ended unconditionally. It's illegal. It should be ended. That's never been uh, 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 at the head of the American agenda. Another thing you would say is that settlements have to stop. You can't settle the territory that you're supposedly negotiating over. It's like saying, we're going to divide up this pizza pie. Let's discuss how we're, how we're going to divide it up. But in the meantime, I'm going to eat it <laughs> while we negotiate a division of it. And that is, what is, that is exactly what has been happening in the West Bank ever since, and in East Jerusalem, ever since 1978, the autonomy accords, uh, and even before. Uh, you would have to say there has to be a right to national self-determination for the Palestinians within equitable borders, and this has to mean independence and sovereignty, full sovereignty. Uh, finally, you'd have to say that such a solution would have to involve a just resolution uh, for the problem of the majority of Palestinians who don't live in the West Bank or Gaza or Jerusalem or inside Israel, but who live uh, outside of uh, historic Palestine uh, after being made homeless either in 1948 or in 1967. These have not been the goals that American policy has pursued. Instead, I would argue, it mainly tried to pressure the Palestinians, who were seen as the weaker party, into conforming to the goals of the Israelis. Uh, and Israel was motivated by the aims that you can see set out, I think, by Begin way back in the 70s in service of an ideal of the greater land of Israel. And if you think of Israeli governments since then, there have been some labor governments. Rabin's in 1975 was one. There were several. There was the Barak government. There were others. Um, but all of them, have in, and most of them have been coalition governments, uh, but almost all of them have included Likud as a dominant force. And most of them have been Likud governments. Begin's governments, Shamir's governments, Netanyahu's two governments. Netanyahu is about to become the longest serving Israeli prime minister in the entire history of the state. All of these governments have been motivated, uh, uh, certainly the Likud-dominated ones, by this idea 
of a greater land of Israel, which is based on a, a simple premise. There is one people with real rights in the land, and that's the, that's the Jewish people. This is the land of Israel. The Palestinians are there at best on sufferance. And whatever rights they have are rights that are allowed to them by the real owners, the real, the people with the real title. Uh, and for some people, this is biblical title. For others, it's just, you know, we are the people of this land. Uh, but in any case, all of this necessarily involves uh, uh, preventing the Palestinians from achieving genu genuine self-determination and fully independent statehood. All of it involves maintaining permanent, effective control uh, of uh, uh, all of the territories occupied in 1967. Now, in the Oslo Accords of 1993, the ones that were signed on the White House lawn, and most of which were negotiated at Oslo in Norway, the Palestinian leadership, the PLO leadership headed then by Yasser Arafat, in my view, mistakenly accepted what it assumed would be a temporary deal. Now, if you read Begin's memo of 1978, which was unearthed, again, by another student of mine in the Israel State Archives, in which he sets down in his own handwriting in Hebrew and English what he's going to try and achieve uh, at Camp David. Uh, it's a, it's the, the, the memo is in the papers of the chief of his office. Um, it's pretty clear that the deal that was negotiated by the Rabin government in, Camp De at, at, uh, in Oslo was completely in keeping with Begin's bottom line. Um, there was to be no real Palestinian sovereignty. There was to be no real control by the Palestinians over land and water and so forth. Uh, there was to be Israeli security control of the entire envelope between the river and the sea, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Far from being temporary, this bad deal, the Oslo deal, has constituted the basis of the status quo for the past 20 years. The Palestinians have lived, in essence, under a deal that was based on outlines that Begin scribbled on a piece of paper in preparation for Camp David. Um, what I show in the book, it's not mainly about Israel, it's mainly about the United States, is that the United States has acquiesced in this over time in spite of the misgivings of president after president. The only one who didn't have misgivings about this was George W. Bush. Every president since Carter has seen some of the problems with this formula. Every one of them has tried to push back. President Reagan tried to push back with the Reagan plan. President Carter tried to push back at Camp David. Secretary Baker tried to push back in, in Madrid and, and, and in Washington. Uh, president Clinton tried to push back in the negotiations he headed. This president has tried to push back. None of them, however, have succeeded. I instead. It's been American domestic political calculations. It's been the degree to which Israel has really become a domestic American political issue that has determined outcomes. The United States simply doesn't want differences with Israel on this issue. And its policy, far from serving to end this conflict, I would argue, has amounted to conflict perpetuation or even conflict exacerbation. Um, I could go into a great deal of detail, uh, and I was going to, but I think I'm going to skip this section of the talk about how, on other issues, the United States has simply not paid the same attention to domestic political considerations. Uh, I mentioned all of these issues, going back to the War of Attrition, the Rogers Plan, the ceasefire on the Suez Canal in 1970, the disengagement agreements of the early 70s, the peace treaty at Camp David and then the 79 peace treaty. In all of these cases, American policymakers overruled Israeli preferences and pushed outcomes that were successful in diffusing conflict and were successful in achieving advantage over the Soviet Union. They were aimed at doing both things. In the end, Egypt was moved from the Soviet column to the American column, and the United States basically won the Cold War in the Middle East. This is a not inconsiderable policy victory for people like Kissinger and, 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 and Secretary of State Vance, Presidents uh, uh, Nick, uh, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Uh, and war was prevented between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1973. Again, something important. At the same time, this conflict was diffused. I talk uh, about why that was the case, and I would argue that uh, that still is the case where major strategic issues uh, are in question. More recently, both the George W. Bush administration and the Obama administration have ignored, completely ignored, intense pressure from the Netanyahu government either to acquiesce in and give the wherewithal necessary for an Israeli attack on Iran or for the United States itself to attack Iran. There was enormous pressure in the second Bush administration uh, on uh, the president. There was enormous pressure on this president uh, by Netanyahu uh, 
to do these, one of these two things or both, the United States simply ignored them. It simply did what was perceived to be in the American national interest. Nobody in Washington, uh, uh, they understood, even the Bush administration understood, uh, was going to agree to a third American land war in West Asia in the 21st century. That would have been A, foolish, and B, unpopular. Strategically foolish, politically disastrous. And uh, Bush and Obama understood that. I would argue much the same calculation went into the US decision not to attack Syria recently. Same kind of thinking was at work. And again, it was an American decision made for American reasons, and very little attention was paid to US allies, whether Israel or Saudi Arabia, both of which are very unhappy about that. Um, I, I, I would go into more detail about how policymakers have similarly ignored the opposition of Israel uh, on the issue of selling arms uh, to the Arab Gulf countries. Um, where uh, Israel has objected, the United States has simply gone ahead ever since the Reagan administration with major arms deals. In 2011, the United States was the world's largest arms exporter, $66 billion. It's the largest total of arms sold abroad by any country in the history of arms sales. Two-thirds of those went to Arab countries, Arab Gulf countries. Uh, it, was, it was a humongous sale to Saudi Arabia and major sales to three other countries. Uh, in every one of these cases, uh, it was clear to people in Washington that this was vital to the defense industry in an era of de declining defense budgets. And this was seen as in the US interest in terms of the American confrontation with Iran. And Israeli considerations simply uh, uh, were not taken into account. Uh, by way of contrast, in other words, these are seen, whether the, the, the conflicts I talked about in the 70s and the 80s or these arms sales were seen as being in the strategic interest of the United States. By contrast, uh, no one in Washington seems to believe that the U.S. strategic interest is involved where Palestine is concerned, and so this issue is one where decisions are made basically with an eye to domestic considerations. I want to say a little bit about some of the Arab countries before I finish and their relationship with the United States and how that affects American policymaking on Palestine. What about the Arab countries? In my view, the Arab countries on this issue can be compared to Sherlock Holmes's dog that did not bark. It's like they're not there. Saudi Arabia has been the pillar of American policy in the Arab world since 1933. Long before Israel existed, the United States had an alliance with Saudi Arabia. In 1945, a dying President Roosevelt spends a whole day of the remaining 40 days of his life meeting with the Saudi king in Egypt. It was important. It was considered important by American policymakers. It has been the pillar of American Middle East policy, the Saudi-American relationship. Uh, but this country has actually played quite an equivocal role where the Palestine issue is concerned. Publicly, the kingdom pays scrupulous lip service to the Palestine clause. But in private, as we now know from the documents that are available to us, Saudi diplomacy has taken quite a different tack. Um, and this issue goes right back to 1945, because the thing that King Ibn Saud talked to President Roosevelt about the most in 1945 was the Palestine issue. And in consequence, the president sent the, Israel, the king a letter in which he said the United States would do nothing on Palestine that would harm Arab interests or without prior consultation with the Arabs. So Roosevelt said, we will do nothing in Palestine that will harm the Arabs, and we will be sure to consult with you beforehand. Well, the United States, as you may have noticed, didn't do those two things. It went ahead and supported the establishment of Israel over the ruins of Arab Palestine. Um, in spite of these promises, uh, embodied in a letter sent in April, just before the president died, actually, uh, to King Ibn Saud, uh, there was no significant reaction from the Saudis. American presidents have been able to ignore these pledges, these 1945 pledges, without fear of losing the strategic advantages that are provided by the American-Saudi relationship. And I, I, I quote, uh, I can quote them now, but I won't, various instances of how pleasantly surprised American uh, secretaries of state from Marshall onwards to Kissinger were uh, when the Saudis proved uh, to be uh, very conciliatory and private. In fact, the term that Marshall used in a letter to the king was to thank him for his conciliatory manner over Palestine in 1948. Well, in 1948, the United States supported the creation of Israel. And three quarters of a million Palestinians were expelled. And the kingdom said nothing. And from that point onwards, 
uh, you, I think you could argue that you have essentially what in effect amounts to Saudi unconcern where Palestine is at issue. Uh, and so I think you have to understand that the alliances that the United States has had with Saudi Arabia really since the 30s or the 40s, depending on when you want to date it, and its relationship with Israel, which has developed into an alliance at least since the 60s, are in fact usually not contradictory. Uh, these are frequently, in fact, complementary, as you can see from the identical positions of Saudi Arabia and Israel on the issue of Iran. They are both outraged at the American uh, uh, shift towards considering the possibility of a deal over Iran's uh, nuclear capabilities. Um, as a result, the United States has been able to have its cake and eat it too, uh, aligning itself firmly with Israeli aims where Palestine is concerned without jeopardizing its vital interests in the Arab petro monarchies, headed, of course, by Saudi Arabia. And this pattern, I think, explains why my good friends John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt are not completely right. In fact, it is not only the Israel lobby that drives US Middle Eastern policy. It's a bunch of other things. And one of them is the fact that there is no contradiction between the vital American strategic interests that are involved in alignment with these oil-producing monarchies and unfailing US support for Israel. Because um, in the short term, there's no cost. And nobody in Washington thinks about the long term. If they think beyond the next election, it's a miracle. Uh, they rarely do. Um, there is a long term, however. And I want to just say one thing, more thing about the Arab world before I conclude. Anybody who pays attention to the opinion polls that are done on Arab public opinion, and there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, Jim Zogby does a bunch. There are several very good uh, pollsters who do public opinion polls that are, that are repeated over time. Anybody who looks at them knows that throughout the Arab world, opinion is overwhelmingly uh, unhappy with the American bias in favor of Israel. But we all also know that most Arab states are not democracies. Even the ones that have sort of overthrown their autocrats don't seem to be making much progress in that direction. Um, many of their rulers are heavily dependent on American favor. And more and more of them, I mean, since the Iraq War, more and more of these governments are aligned with the United States. Uh, Washington has therefore been able to ignore the views of people in these countries uh, on the Palestine issue. Uh, if, however, and this is a big if, if fundamental and lasting democratization ever takes place in the Arab world, I mean, it may take a very long time. Uh, if you look at if you look at stable, sustainable, democratic transition uh, uh, in countries like England or France, this sometimes took over a century. It took the British well over a century, just from the time of the English Revolution in the 17th century through the Glorious Revolution, uh, through the 18th century period when kings no longer really uh, uh, determined uh, outcomes. Uh, the French took even longer. Uh, you can say, well, they had a democracy with the revolution. Yeah, they had a democracy with the revolution, and then they had an empire. There's nothing democratic about Napoleon. And then they had a restoration. There was not, nothing uh, democratic about Louis XVIII or Charles X. Then they had a, a, a liberal monarchy with a parliament. Then they had a second republic. But then they had another empire. No parliament, no democracy. Yes, they had a third republic, but then they had Vichy. Vichy was a fascist regime in France in the 20th century. 150 years after the revolution, the French had still not had a sustained, full, complete democratic transition. That's France, okay? The home of liberty, equality, fraternity, remember? French Revolution. So if the Arab world is not doing this quickly, uh, I don't think we should look down our long noses at them and say, well, you know, you should do it like we did. We just had a revolution in 1776 and we had a constitution, boom! It doesn't usually work like that. You usually have to cut the heads off of kings and you have a big mess. And, goes on and on and on for five and six and eight generations. In fact, some people would argue that until the fifth French Republic was established, 173 years, the French had not had a final, successful, full transition to a sustainable form of democracy. If, however, such a transition takes place in the Arab world, whenever that happens, um, a day of reckoning could come for US policy on Palestine in particular. If these things happen, and if the policies of the Arab countries represent the views of their peoples. We know what their people think. Their people support the Palestinians. Then there will be a cost, a short-term cost, to the traditional American policy of aligning uh, completely on the Israeli position and ignoring the Palestinian position. Um, this 
policy has had some very serious short-term costs. When we went to Madrid in 1991, in October, when I flew to Madrid, actually I flew there from Amman. I had to fly from Chicago to Amman to prepare suddenly without, I'll tell you the story later if you're interested. Uh, when we flew to Madrid, there were under 200,000 Israeli settlers living in the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem. There were still some of them in Gaza, the ones that were removed in 2005, a few thousand. Today, there are about 650,000. Numbers are not exact, 620, 650. Over three times as many settlers. When I went from Jerusalem to Ramallah in 1991, anybody could go from Jerusalem to Ramallah, and anybody could go from Ramallah to Jerusalem. It took you 15 minutes, 25 minutes at most at night, a little more in the daytime. Palestinians could move freely. There was a small class of Palestinians against whom there were security restrictions. And the overwhelming majority of Palestinians, they could go to the Lake, of Lake Tiberias. They could go to Ilat. They could go to Gaza. Israelis could go anywhere. Palestinians could go anywhere. Today, Palestinians are rigidly restricted in where they can move. Nobody can go to Jerusalem from the West Bank without a permit. And very few people get permits. Some people can't go anywhere. They can't leave the occupied territories. They can't go to Israel. They can't go to Jerusalem. They haven't seen the airport. They've never seen the sea. People in Gaza can't go anywhere at all, with the exception, again, of very narrow categories of people. So from a situation where narrow categories of Palestinians had movement restrictions, narrow categories of Palestinians are able to move. And everybody else is under restriction. So the situation has gotten immeasurably worse for the Palestinians in the 20 years since Madrid. And the situation in terms of Israeli control has gotten significantly worse. Uh, I would argue that US policies have helped produce these outcomes. Um, you now have one in 10 Jewish Israelis who lives in the occupied territories. How is a democratic Israeli government going to ignore one 10 percent of voters? How are you going to change this reality? How do you change this dynamic? There wasn't such a dynamic in 1991, or even, even more so back in the 70s or the 80s. Um, all of these things didn't happen by happenstance. They were explicitly intended by Israeli planners, especially uh, Sharon when he was uh, Minister of Agriculture, and then later as Prime Minister, to make impossible the separation of the West Bank and Jerusalem from Israel, to make impossible the creation of a viable, sovereign, contiguous Palestinian state. They, these are not settlements placed where they are just because somebody has a sentimental attachment to this hilltop. They were placed in ways to chop the West Bank up into little cantons, bantustans, call them what you will. Uh, uh, these fait accomplis have produced a whole series of insuperable obstacles to, the, to any kind of solution certainly to a two-state solution. And these are things that have happened, many of them, most of them, over the past 20 years since this so-called peace process has been uh, underway. American policymakers are not just guilty of inaction. They have actually been involved in crafting this outcome. They've acquiesced in these things. And beyond that, they've willfully ignored the fact that we help to produce these outcomes with $3 billion in military aid every year, which has helped to sustain the occupation with hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, tax-free charitable contributions which go to sustain the settlement enterprise. People who give money for the settlements are giving them to 501c3s, which means they don't pay taxes. To make up that revenue shortfall, we pay taxes. So we, taxpayers, are subsidizing a settlement enterprise which is against international law and which is against US policy. But those are tax-free deductions. These are, these are charitable organizations. Uh, so we are, with our tax-free tax -free dollars that go from this country, the settlement enterprises is sustained. And finally, uh, our dipl diplomats have spent a lot of time at the United Nations and el elsewhere uh, running interference uh, for uh, the settlement and occupation uh, of the occupied territories. Um, I think that it has to be said that the rhetoric whereby all of this is screened from the American public is dishonest and debased. Um, what has not happened is peace. That process has produced, in fact, an intensification of the dispersal, the occupation, and the colonization of the Palestinian people and of their homeland. It means that we're further from a resolution of this conflict than we were 22 years ago when we went to Madrid. And rather than acting 
as an honest broker. I think the best words to describe what the United States has done is to act as Israel's lawyer. Uh, these are the words of somebody called Aaron David Miller, who served as a mediator. I mean, I was engaged with him in the 90s, and he served before that and after that. Uh, and he was quoting somebody who should know, Henry Kissinger. Um, I think I've shown that there were several patterns that contributed to this. One has to do with the Arab world. There has been no real sustained pressure on the United States from the oil-rich Arab countries or from other Arab countries to act equitably and to be fair in this conflict. Secondly, policymakers have paid on the Palestine issue obsessive attention to domestic political concerns uh, as these were articulated by the Israel lobby rather than thinking of long-term consequences for the United States. Finally, even though American leaders have often made sympathetic noises, President Carter talked about Palestinian rights, Secretary Baker, President Obama, at the end of the day, the United States was in effect supporting the suppression of the inalienable national and human rights of the Palestinians. I would argue this policy hasn't served the US national interest. Um, I think that interest would be served by a just and lasting resolution of this conflict. It's taken an enormous amount of what Orwell called corrupt language to conceal this reality. Now, what does this excursion into history tell us about Secretary Kerry's chances? Uh, I'm a historian. I try to avoid making predictions. I, I sometimes say the job description of a historian does not include telling anything about the future. We talk about the past and how it created the present. But I would offer that very simply, you cannot build anything on the kind of rotten foundation that the United States has established in the last 35 years. The parties are negotiating from positions of gaping inequality. One is an occupier, the other is an occupied people. The ostensible mediator overtly favors the stronger party, Israel. And finally, the Oslo Accords and all the accords that followed it form and that form the basis for these negotiations are based on a blueprint drawn up by Menachem Begin, which was intended to prevent an equitable two-state outcome. Whatever transpires, I argue that these conditions would seem to guarantee that it will not be a just and lasting peace in which the Palestinian people end their nearly century-long century odyssey and in which both peoples get to live in peace and security, uh, whether in one state or two states or some kind of confederation. It doesn't really matter. Uh, that's going to be the outcome. Uh, if history tells us anything, it is that this process cannot produce any such just outcome. It, it will just produce some extension into the future of the entirely unsatisfactory status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. My question is uh, uh, why the Palestinian side continue to be part of this dishonest game of peace process? Mm -hmm. And what is your suggestion for the Palestinian side? Thank you. Yeah. That's, a very, that's a very good question, actually. Get closer to this mic. That's a very good question, actually. Um, I'll tell you the reason. The reason is that the leadership that's engaged in this um, negotiation uh, in Ramallah is probably completely unrepresented of the people that it purports to represent. I mean, if you look at the polls, polls you know, are ephemeral things. They change. But overwhelming a majority of Palestinians uh, do not think that this negotiation is going to produce a positive outcome. Uh, they would like it to, but they know that it won't. And they're probably right. Uh, and the reason is very simple. This leadership is not just represent unrepresentative. It's massively supported by the United States and Israel. Um, one of the things that I discovered is that the people who put together the Oslo Accords from the Israeli side, Prime Minister Rabin and his advisors, were mainly military men. And their thinking was very much dictated by their perception that the first intifada from 1987 until 1991 had shown that Israel couldn't continue to control the occupied territories as it had from 1967 onward. And that you had to bring in some Palestinian intermediary to maintain Israel's control. And that's how they saw the PLO coming into the occupied territories. That's how they saw the PA. Now, the PLO didn't, I think, necessarily realize this. But that's what they, that's what, that's what they, they were, they were uh, uh, intended, the role that they were intended to serve. And so Israel has, and the United States, have been very supportive of the PA, which is entirely dependent on external support, whether from the Europeans or Arab countries or Japan or, or the United States or Israel. It's, it, the money that it, it, that it gets from Palestinians, from Palestinian taxes and customs, that come via Israel. 
And the Israelis can turn off the spigot anytime they want. And they've done it repeatedly whenever they got peaked with the, with the PA not being submissive and subordinate enough. And what should they do? Just to answer your second question, very simply, they should say, we will only negotiate on X, Y, Z basis. We will only negotiate on a basis of international law. This was a interim agreement, which is supposed to last for seven years. The PA is now in abeyance. We will continue to govern ourselves, but we don't believe that this agreement or anything having to do with it has any further validity because it was supposed to be an interim agreement. There was supposed to be a permanent status negotiation. When we went to Washington, the, the, the whole process, uh, process was supposed to end by 1997 or 1998. There was supposed to be an end to this. 22 years on, it's still an interim. So you say, it's over. We want to start all new, anew. We want to negotiate on this and that basis. And we will only negotiate with a, 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 a mediator that is actually impartial. So the United States has to be at the table. It's a superpower. But my, my argument would be, have the United States sit next to the Israelis, which would sort of reflect the real balance of forces. And then the Palestinians would be all by themselves on the other side with some mediator, whoever. It literally almost doesn't matter. No one would be as biased as the Americans. Rashid, thanks so much for that tour de force lecture. It's an honor to have you here at the University of Denver. You emphasized the domestic equation here inside the U.S. as paramount mm -hmm. in... On this issue. On this question of um, the formation of U.S. policy on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But you discussed it in somewhat um, unchanging terms, mm -hmm. which it was, in fact, for many decades, indeed. But now we're in an interesting situation where it's at least arguably changing. It's fluid. Um, one can uh, measure, uh, to some extent, um, A, through the creation of an organization like J Street and its influence, um, and, and both what J Street's creation reflected and also what it has produced in some sense. And public opinion polls of American Jews, for example, show, uh, particularly generationally, that there is a major shift um, afoot uh, in this country. Um, in terms of how American Jews view the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You're a professor. You see it every day on college campuses as we do here. So my question for you is, uh, can you perhaps account a bit for this shift taking place <coughs> domestically in the U.S. Um, in which the Israel lobby is no longer as um, hegemonic uh, as it once was, or the, the nature of the Israel lobby is shifting? Uh, internally, what might this portend for um, <coughs> the um, the U.S. role in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? And I'll just uh, tack this particular uh, question on to the end, which is that you're the only person in this room, I think, uh, unless I'm mistaken, and you might be one of the only commentators on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict who actually knows Barack Obama personally. So if you, a fact which almost cost him his election in 2008. I don't think it almost cost him <clears throat> his election, but anyway. So if you could McCain just. McCain going to lose that one no matter what. Probably, he probably. But if you could just take us a little bit inside the mind of Obama, and I, and I mean this seriously. I mean, you actually know the man personally. That doesn't mean that you. you knew well, the man. Okay. Well, there you go. So I'll, you're already starting to answer the question. But my point is you, you do know him um, from his Chicago days. You were fellow Hyde Parkers, neighbors, colleagues at the University of Chicago. Um, you do have a sense of, of, of the way he thinks. Could you give us a sense of where you see him, his center of gravity, on this question? Well, let me answer the second question by, by starting with, sorry, let me answer the first question by starting with the second question. I think that um, the evolution of Barack Obama on this issue indicates the fact that it, it, political realities in the United States have not changed. Uh, I agree with some of the premise of your first question. I think things have changed on several levels in the United States. But I don't think that that has been reflected in any way, either in policy or in political discourse. I mean, if you listen to what was said in the Republican Democratic parties throughout this election, if you watched the kind of reception that Prime Minister Netanyahu got on Capitol Hill during the first Obama administration, I think you'd have to agree that on the political level, we still are in a relatively frozen situation. I don't think that discourse, political discourse in this country, in terms of the kind of 
lying, dishonest, corrupt, debased language, which is everywhere, has changed one bit. Uh, Secretary Kerry, the president, read the president's speeches. Every one of his speeches on Palestine embodies trope after trope after trope of the Israeli narrative. He talks about the Palestinians, but read what he says about Israel. And I think you, and he's, it, it's written for him, we know who writes these speeches. We know precisely which person in the National Security Council writes th those sections of those speeches for him. He's somebody who represents an unchanged mindset. So I, I, I think that if you look at somebody like Obama, who has a more disparate background than anybody who's ever sat in the White House, I mean, there have been butlers and servants in the White House who had an African background. But there's never been a man sitting in the Oval Office who's had that background. You never had somebody who grew up abroad to the extent to which he did. You never had someone who has a Muslim parent in his background. You never had anybody with these kinds of elements to his makeup. So he's a very different kind of person than anyone who's ever served as President of the United States. Um, and he was an intellectual. I mean, he's a law professor. He wasn't just a professor. He was a professor of law, constitutional law, at the University of Chicago. Um, and he was a person who had an open and questioning mind. He's a very intelligent man. Michelle may even be more intelligent. But she's not the president. He's the president. Um, and yet, he has repeated every frozen, mindless shibboleth around this conflict in every one of his speeches. Read them. I, I, I go through them in, in the third chapter of my book. Um, uh, Israel is always in existential danger. Is Israel in existential danger? Is there actually a danger to the existence of the state of Israel today? I, you'd, I, I'd say that, talk about that strategically. Don't talk about fears. Don't talk about uh, subjective perceptions. Talk about the cold, hard, strategic facts. There is not now, and has not been for a very long time, an existential threat to the existence of Israel. The president repeats this in virtually every speech. It serves as the basis for a whole mindset in American policymaking, which fits like interlocking pieces into the Israeli mindset. So on the political level, on the level of American political discourse, Obama or no Obama, there are changes, there are differences between the Bush administration, say, and the Obama administration. But on that basic level, I don't think there's been a change. Uh, I, I, what else can I say about, uh, about, about him? Um, I, I haven't had anything to do with him for years and years. I don't think he ha was in any danger of losing the uh, election because of his connection either with Reverend Wright or Bill Ayers or myself. Um, and I think that um, he, is a, he is and has always been a very canny politician who has a very shrewd read of the political landscape and who argues, I will only do a thing if I'm pushed. And his reading of the American domestic political landscape is there's nothing to push him on this issue. He's not the only American president to know that what the United States is doing in some ways is harmful and foolish in terms of its long-term interests. I have argued President Carter knew that. President, even President Reagan, who was very pro-Israel, knew that. President uh, Clinton knew that. President Bush Sr. knew that. This president knows that. It never appeared ultimately in their policy on Palestine because they read the political map better or worse than this president. Uh, to go back to the first part of your first question, there has been a change. There is an ongoing change, not so much on the level of political discourse, but certainly in academic discourse, in universities, among young people, in churches, in synagogues, among the Muslim community, the Arab American community, the Jewish community, uh, among, uh, and among liberal Protestant churches. Uh, so on the one hand, you've had a, a much greater openness to debate uh, around these issues. And the first inkling for Americans of there even being another side to this issue. Uh, when I grew up, there was only one side to the issue. There was the Exodus, Paul Newman side. And that's all you knew. I mean, that's all you were allowed to know. There was literally nothing else, nor academically, nor in public, you know, in the media. The movies were anti it, The whole framing of the issue was essentially one-sided. That has begun to change, at least in those areas. It hasn't really changed entirely in the media. I mean, you read a story in the New York Times, and you have to deconstruct it very carefully. But all, not all that much has changed. Uh, things have changed. But on the media level, not all that much. Some things, but not all that much. We can discuss that later.
where the has been positive change, as I've said, has been in academia. You actually can write on the subject of Palestine and not be punished with you having your career destroyed. Uh, it, it's still, you're still threatened, but it's not destroyed. Um, you can be, you know, you can have, tr you, there, will, there may be trouble, but there will not be the kind of, that's it, you're finished, which was the case 30 or 20 or 40 years ago. So there's been an enormous opening up. On the other hand, and I think this is also important, there's been a shift in the base of support for Israel. If you look at the people on the floor of Congress who were the most enthusiastic in their reception of Prime Minister Netanyahu, in the two or three occasions that he spoke to uh, joint sessions of, I think two occasions when he spoke to joint sessions of Congress, the Republicans were by far the most enthusiastic. And that represents a shift in the South and in the West of this country among evangelicals, among people who are oriented towards the Tea Party and other uh, conservative right-wing groups mainly associated with the Republican Party, and which are very supportive of Israel. So what you might call Christian Zionist support of Israel has increased, just as there's much more nuance in the way people in the Jewish community and in other communities, liberal Protestant communities and so on, on the campuses look at it. So yes, there's been change, but I wouldn't say everything is going, you know, uh, uh, swimmingly and, you know, all, all will be for the best in the best of all possible worlds in two or three years. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Certainly things are getting better in some areas, but uh, the political process has not been changed yet. Very long answer, sorry. Okay. Two long questions. Two questions. Hello. Um, I thought I'd ask my question since you just mentioned um, the Zionist movement, um, evangelical Christian how has, it seems to me, you, are, you said that there are two possible reasons for the American biasness for Israeli uh, towards Israel. support, yeah, towards Israel. Um, one being biblical, the other just kind of being, oh, well, they're there. Um, but how has uh, the Zionist movement influenced um, the negotiations um, that have happened that really, you said, you know, put America next to Israel at the table. If we were to take God and the Zionist you know, movement out of that, would there still be much reason for putting America next to Israel at the table? And uh, how have administrations that you've seen uh, dealt with uh, that problem? Well, um, a lot has changed since the 40s. Uh, in the 40s, for one thing, uh, American Zionism developed among the Jewish community and only really became a majority uh, movement in the, in, the, in the early 1940s. There was a meeting in, I believe, Pittsburgh in 1944, which was the first time that a major Jewish grouping in the United States formally came out in support of Zionism. It was right after the Biltmore Program was uh, established in 1942, which is the first time that the Zionist movement itself called for Palestine to be turned into a Jewish state. They'd never said that the, that was their objective. Um, and support for Israel was mainly restricted in those years to two groups people who were supportive of Israel because they were Jewish, or people who supported Israel for strategic reasons. Uh, there were people who, like in Britain, were what you could call Christian Zionists. I mean, Lloyd George supported the Balfour Declaration back in 1917 out of his reading of the Bible. And you could argue that there were some Americans who felt that way in policy-making circles, but the only element of the American public that was really committed was among the Jewish community. And the reasons for American support for Israel diversified over time. Uh, there was a they are like us argument. They're the, the only democracy in the Middle East. There's the, uh, they're pioneers settling a hostile land, you know, sort of comparing subtly Israeli pioneers to American pioneers and Arabs to Native Americans. So, you know, a bunch of savages trying to prevent progress, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can sort of see how those narratives might run. And they were, they were successful uh, for people for whom religion wasn't necessarily important and who didn't think of the strategy. Uh, so the strategic and the religious were elements, among others, uh, even in the early days. Um, Israel doesn't really become a major strategic ally until the 60s. Uh, Israel's first wars were fought right up to 1967, the 48 war, the uh, 56 war, and the 67 war, largely with French and British weapons. Uh, the United States only became a major arms supplier to Israel in the 1960s. And the real alliance, the real connection, the major arms uh, shipments, the uh, billions of dollars in aid only really begin in the 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s. So that, that, that strategic connection is a whole other set of 
concerns. Israel becomes a proxy in the Cold War, just as Syria and Egypt are seen as Soviet proxies. And in that situation, Israel uh, gets support from the United States, not because people like Israel because they like their brown eyes or because they're Democrats or because the Bible says so, but because they are fighting the Cold War on the American side. Uh, and that continues right up through the 80s. I mean, Reagan's support for Israel is largely Cold War support. Reagan didn't have a religious bone in his body. He didn't care about the Bible. He cared about Soviet, the evil empire, Soviet communism, and he wanted to drive the Soviets out of the Middle East. Uh, and that was true for a lot of American policymakers. Now you have this new element, um, this, this Christian Zionist element, which I think is actually gr of growing importance. And it, it's going to, I think it's going to, you're going to, I, I don't want to predict, but you're already seeing a shift uh, to more and more to the Republican Party. And a Republican Party that's dominated more and more by these uh, districts gerrymandered so as to represent, you know, very extreme uh, uh, views of the conservative wing of the Republican Party. And those people tend to have a very simple-minded view of the world. There's good and there's bad. And often it's a religious view, evil and good. And um, for them, Israel is good. And the Arabs are a bunch of evil terrorists. And so there's just no, there's no contest for them. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a nuanced thing. Um, but that is, that is actually new uh, uh, in terms of the religious element, uh, which was there. But the, the importance of it, uh, I think, is new. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You'll be um, next, and you'll be next. So I was just wondering, um, you talked about how there are very few presidents since the Carter administration, or most presidents gave a little bit of pushback since the Carter administration. Mm -hmm. The only one who did not was George W. Bush. Right. Um, but he's also the first president to uh, publicly support the two-state solution. Right. And I'm wondering if you think that this is actually negative for the entire peace process. Um, for him to take that stance mm -hmm. and kind of do it as more of a way to appease Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabian pressure rather than really fully support and be dedicated to the cause? Right. That's actually a good question. Um, both President Bush Jr., George W., and President Reagan had in the back of their minds placating the Saudis. So that part of your question is completely right. Um, that's one of the reasons that the president in 1982 wanted to float the Reagan plan. And it's one of the reasons that George W. Bush talked about a Palestinian state. He was under a lot of pressure from the Saudis um, to say it. The point is that in both cases, this, this proved to be lip service. Uh, this president, Bush, George W., probably did more to facilitate, first of all, to empty this term, a Palestinian state, of real meaning. And secondly, to facilitate this process of, 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 of uh, Israel fastening sort of permanent control over the occupied territories. And he did this in a letter that he sent to uh, Prime Minister Sharon in April of 2004, where for the first time the United States, which had previously called Israeli settlements either illegal or an obstacle to peace, he told the Israeli Prime Minister that Israeli settlement blocks would become part of the solution and basically gave them legitimacy in a way that no American president ever had done. And what that basically meant was the United States now endorsed pretty much the entire course of what Sharon had done throughout his career as minister uh, from the 70s onwards to create a, a, a reality which made a two-state solution impossible. So the same president who was, as you accurately said, the first one to talk about a Palestinian state was also the one who gave the imprimatur of American support to Israeli policies that were designed to make impossible the creation of a Palestinian state. So there's the paradox for you. Thank you, sir, for, for speaking. And you've raised some very excellent points. And uh, I think a lot of people aren't aware of a lot of the different aspects. As we talk some more about religion and Christianity, um, the point that I, I think a lot of people seem to miss, and I'd like to know your take on this, is that Christianity did originate in this region. Right. And that if you look at the numbers, the Christians, not only in Israel, but in some of the surrounding countries, have immigrated, I think, in much greater numbers to the extent that someday you'll go make a pilgrimage to see a museum that's devoid of worshipers. And uh, why don't the religious groups, not only in this country, but in Europe, 
and in traditionally Christian countries and the high churches and in, in so-called high churches especially ever raise this point. It mm -hmm. seems like in most American considerations, no one has any concept that Christians had anything to do with the current right. Middle East. Right. What are your thoughts? You know, that's another good question. Um, actually, of all of the religious groups, within, of all of the churches, Christian churches, the one that has been the most consistent in pushing this issue has actually been the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Vatican has been very insistent in arguing for the maintenance of a Christian presence in the Holy Land and has put its money where its mouth is. And this is not as true of the American bishops. The American church has not in any way been as forthright or as forthcoming on this issue. But the church itself, the Vatican itself, the pope, several popes, have been very forceful on this and have engaged in quite active diplomacy with Israel. And it's actually had some effect. But uh, you're basically right. It's not just in Palestine or in Israel that the Christians are dwindling. And they're dwindling for multiple reasons. One reason they're dwindling is because they have better education. They have better uh, ability to get out and to find uh, uh, jobs and, and, and get visas to elsewhere. Uh, anybody who can get out can, is getting out of many of these countries, uh, whether Christian or Muslim. But Christians tend to have better education. Secondly, uh, a lot of them are involved in business. And the conditions of occupation have just made business so difficult. And so they're constantly frustrated. Uh, you can go to Beit Jada or you can go to Bethlehem, which used to be primar primarily Christian towns or cities. Um, and they're now minority Christian, have minority Christian populations. Same, same is true in Nazareth, which used to have a Christian majority. Um, in all of these cases, these are cities where the Muslim population is largely refugees. <laughs> or people who've come in from the countryside. But it, there's both an inflow of Muslims into these towns, and there's an outflow of Christians uh, from them. And part of it is just the occupation, in, insofar as the West Bank and, and Jerusalem are concerned, make er, which makes everybody's life so much harder, um, which has been going on for two, two generations and more, uh, and which in some ways affects Christians more because they have, as I say, better education, better access to capital, better human capital and often have relatives abroad. I mean, the, the emigration of Christians from the Holy Land in this part of the world didn't start in 1948. Um, you have large uh, communities in the United States from Ramallah and Bejala and Bethlehem that go back to the 18, 1890s. Uh, there's a Palestinian community in Knoxville, Tennessee. There's a Palestinian community in almost every you know, major city of the United States whose roots go back to the 1880s and 90s. The same is true with Lebanese Christians and so on. These people were emigrating long before. And so they have people to go to when they emigrate in a way which is often not true for Muslims or other people from other communities. The last thing is that you have a rise of militant anti-Christian fundamentalism in many Arab countries. In, in Egypt, this is a serious problem. In Syria, it's a serious problem. It's a problem in Palestine. Well, not as serious as the others, but serious nonetheless. And then you have a hostility to the United States for its various policies, its occupation of Iraq or its other policies that are seen as inimical to the Arab world, most notably around Palestine. And this hostility to the United States sometimes translates into hostility towards Christians. So you have all of these elements making the life of Christians in, the, in, the, in Palestine in particular, but in the Middle East in general, more difficult. And there are, just last thing, come, come ahead. And, and there are a large Christian, there was a huge Christian community in Iraq. The American invasion of Iraq helped to destroy the Christian community in Iraq. Over a million people left. There's a very large Christian community in Syria. They are being driven out today. Uh, there's, we know about Lebanon, which has about a more, more, perhaps more than a third of its population is Christian. Uh, there's a, there are millions of Christians in Egypt. So these are not minor, tiny minorities. We're talking about millions and millions of people. Uh, just those four countries. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you earlier for the uh, talk. With the, um, the current regime in Iran, with their rhetoric right now, potentially being more optimistic mm -hmm. going forward, do you think the Palestinian Authority uh, should or can learn the lessons from Iran's rhetoric that may change the, the dynamics of this negotiating mm -hmm. going forward? What do you mean exactly? Learn from their rhetoric. Oh, so I mean, Iran, um, Rouhani's talking about engaging with the United States, which has, you know, in a sense, made Israel kind of uh, 
Nervous. Nervous, <laughs> which has changed the dynamic. So right. if the Palestinian Authority was to take a lesson, if at all, I know it's, it's sort of a different analogy, not having an actual yeah. state, but maybe taking a step back or taking a different approach towards the problem, would that be well, in your favor? Well, you know, I, actually, the Palestinian Authority, uh, in its current incarnation, headed by Mahmoud Abbas, has been pretty conciliatory towards the United States. I, I think they've actually bent over backwards. Um, I think they should take, a, 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 frankly, a different tack. I think they should say to the United States, you know, you have brokered an agreement which has been harmful to us. It's an interim agreement. The interim period is over. And we want to take a completely different course. And if you want to be a mediator, you have to be an honest broker. You have to be an impartial mediator. You have to repudiate the 1975 letter that President Ford, you know, the United States says, we, we, that was our policy. Our policy has changed on all kinds of issues. They could say that here. They could say what actually President Nixon, before this letter was sent by his successor, said to his Secretary of State when he came into office. This has just been revealed in the documents that have been published in the Foreign Relations of the United States series. He said, the United States wants to take an even-handed position on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Well, in America, you could, the United States should be told, I think, by the PA, until you publicly say we're going to take an even-handed position, not a position where there's no daylight between the American position and Israel, but where you're equidistant between us and the Israelis. We don't want you as a mediator. You know, we're happy to have good relations with you. We like you. We think you're wonderful people. But you don't belong in the middle of a negotiation between us and a party with whose position your position is identical. So that's what I would say. But, you know, who am I? Yes. Good evening. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the end game for the Israeli government? Uh, because it seems that... Israel has been stalling for time so that the West Bank can be totally colonized and annexed, and that the status quo has been sustained to achieve this goal. So am I, first of all, am I correct to make this assumption? Because, because if so, then isn't negotiation to achieve a two-state solution just hopeful thinking till the Israeli calculus changes? I mean, I could give you a very short answer, yes. <laughs> I think you're right. And I mean, if you read the Israeli press, most commentators say that too. These people aren't serious. They're just doing this because they're being forced to do it. They don't really intend uh, to come to an agreement on, on a two-state basis. If the Palestinians will acquiesce in their position, they'd be happy to have an agreement. But no Palestinian leadership is going to stay in power if it acquiesces in Israel's conditions. You're welcome. Hi. Thank Hi. you for your talk. Um, my question is about the model of this peace process. Um, and wondering, you sort of implied whether even the role of a broker is appropriate when you have such unequal people coming right. to the table. Um, so my question is whether it even matters if the U.S. is an honest broker um, because of the unequalness and the power dynamics, yep. um, and whether it is actually better that the U.S. is just the lawyer to the U.S. or lawyer, lawyer to Israel. Israel. And But then who do the Palestinians have? Right. Um, and is there any historical precedents for thinking about a different model for this? That's a very intelligent question because uh, it used to be argued by a lot of Palestinian leaders that while they had no objection to a negotiation, uh, it wouldn't be a successful negotiation until the Palestinian position was stronger. Uh, and that, yeah, the Palestinians should go to, this was at the time when they talked about Geneva Peace Conference. The Palestinians should go to the Geneva Peace Conference, but only if they're sure that they'll have strong allies in the Arab countries, and that the Soviet Union would balance the Americans. And that even then, they said, the balance of forces has to be improved in our favor. And I think, actually, you've pointed to a good, th there's nothing forcing Israel to make any concessions, because Israel has most of the cards in it hand, its hands. It controls the occupied territories. Unrest is so far manageable, at least, at least since the Second Intifada, it's been manageable. Um, the United States is on board with whatever the Israelis say or do or want. Palestinians don't have any strong supporters anywhere at all. This is not the 70s or the 60s. When you had the non-aligned movement, you had the Soviet Union, you had Arab countries that had their own issues with Israel. Two Arab countries have peace treaties with Israel. Syria is engaged in a civil war. Lebanon has never been a factor. Saudi Arabia, I talked about Saudi Arabia. So it could be argued that the Palestinians should say, we're perfectly willing to negotiate, but you're not going to get anywhere until we're able to strengthen our position. Now, how do you strengthen your position? One of the things that the Palestinians certainly could do is to take the General Assembly decision to recognize Palestine as a state, to join various UN bodies and put a little pressure on Israel, such that Israel has an incentive to 
make concessions. Uh, Israel hates to negotiate under pressure. Everybody hates to negotiate under pressure. But right now, Israel's under no pressure, and the Palestinians are under a lot of pressure. Uh, this might be the kind of thing. Uh, there's an argument that boycott, divestment, and sanctions by increasing, in particular, European pressure on Israel to disengage from the occupied territories could have the same kind of effect. Well, you do that a little bit, you or, and, and, and finally, you end the division in Palestinian ranks so that there's a Palestinian consensus on how to go forward. So the Palestinians are not victim to a division that the United States, other Arab countries, Israel, everybody and his brother-in-law plays on and manipulates. And then you'd be in a stronger position to negotiate. I, I would think it would be foolish to do it any other way. And finally, you should negotiate on the basis of international law. You shouldn't negotiate on the basis of these cockamamie arrangements that the likes of Dennis Ross and his ilk put together back in the Bush administration, the first, or the Clinton administration, which are a, a tilted playing field to produce a tilted outcome. Uh, start from 242, start from 338, start from General Assembly resolutions that talk about refugee rights, start from resolutions which talk about what a Jewish state is. People say Israel is a Jewish state. What was meant by the United Nations in the 1947 UN partition plan when it talked about a Jewish state? That was the internationally legitimate definition of a Jewish state, not what Netanyahu is saying. What was it? First of all, it was a Jewish state that would have had 48% or 46% Arabs. Their rights were to be guaranteed. That has not happened in the state of Israel. Okay? Secondly, it was a state which was to have an economic union with a Palestinian state. It was only to be created alongside a Palestinian state, and these two states were to be uh, in an economic union. Thirdly, Jerusalem was supposed to be a corpus separatum. It was not supposed to be the eternal, unified, exclusively Israeli capital of Israel, which is what it is today in the Israeli view. So uh, you want to go back, I mean, if you want to have a stronger negotiating position, you stress things like this. You want a Jewish state? This is the Jewish state that the United Nations voted for. This is the Jewish state that, you know, for Palestinians would be fine. If Palestinians who live inside Israel are full citizens, have equal rights, and those rights are guaranteed, then, and then you would have a Palestinian state in which presumably the same thing would be true. Uh, then you're talking about a different kind of basis for a negotiation. Uh, I, I, I and many others who were in, got involved in these negotiations in the 90s fault the Palestinian leadership, which was then in Tunis, for not stressing these kinds of things forcefully enough. Uh, uh, we recently had a talk uh, the Edward Said lecture at Columbia a few days ago by Rajesh Hadi, who's a very distinguished Palestinian lawyer. He was one of the advisors to the Palestinian delegate, one of, my, one of my colleagues, one of the other people who was advising. And he kept telling them, you must stress the Geneva Conventions. This is an occupied territory. You have to insist that Israel has obligations under the Geneva Conventions, which these negotiations should stress. And in Tunis, they just didn't understand and they didn't pay attention, and they didn't realize how important that was and what obligations became incumbent on the occupier if the Geneva Convention uh, w w conventions were enforced. One of them is that the occupier cannot transfer its population to the ter occupied territory. There are many, many others. So all kinds of things flow from taking that kind of a position where y you're not negotiating on a, on a skewed playing surface. Um, and if you're interested in this issue of the Geneva Conventions, there's an extraordinarily powerful film made by an Israeli, I think his name is Gilad Atzmon, called The Law in These Parts, which is available, I think. And it's, it's, a, 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 it's a series of interviews with the people who served in the Israeli military justice system in the occupied territories from 1967 until today, actually, until a year or two ago. It includes people, the Supreme Court Justice of Israel, who earlier was a judge, and a dozen or so other people. And this issue comes up, uh, this issue of, of, of Israel's obligations as an occupying power, whether this is an occupation. It's something that Israel has downplayed since 67. It's a fascinating, fascinating subject. Okay, mindful of the fact that Rashid is uh, coming from New York, where they're two hours ahead of us, and then we still have to feed you. That's I'm correct. going to propose we take one more question and then um, call it a night. So go ahead. Thanks so much for Thank your time you, and your remarks. <laughs> All right. I'll uh, try and be brief. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak briefly about um, Israeli internal political dynamics and specifically uh, the exponential growth 
of the ultra orthodox population. There's been a big debate about sort of their role in Israeli society. Um, is there any kind of domestic pushback? Obviously, the ultra orthodox are uh, the bulk, if not the entirety, of the settler population. That's not true. Actually. No, is it not. Okay. Well. Anyway, I'm mistaken. Finish but the question. Is there a domestic political constituency, uh, a significant constituency, sort of pushing back against the uh, the settler movement and yeah. uh, this good question? Situation? Um, you know, in in some ways, things have gone backwards both in Israel and Palestine. If you go back to the '80s or the '90s, the early '90s, uh, in Israel you had a, a a peace movement that was galvanized by the '82 war and which pushed very hard after the first intifada from 1987 to 1991 for a change in Israel's approach. Um, and unfortunately, these negotiations and these agreements diffused that. Similarly, the first intifada put enormous pressure on Israel, such that you know Israeli decision makers like Rabin realized they had to change their policy. Um, and the Palestinians were demobilized after uh, the Oslo Accords, uh, after the beginning of negotiations and then the Oslo Accords. And so, uh, even though the, there was a second intifada, which was extraordinarily violent, um, its impact was exactly the opposite of the first intifada on Israeli public opinion. It pushed Israeli public opinion far to the right. Uh, it didn't serve, in my view, Palestinian interests. I think the first intifada was one of the greater victories, relative victories, in the entirety of Palestinian history. And I think that the second intifada was one of the worst defeats. And there are a lot of defeats in Palestinian history. So we're talking about up there on a very large list, long list. Um, and so the impact has been that there has been a movement rightwards uh, of, of Israeli public opinion. Uh, there are people who are v very strongly opposed to the occupation, but uh, strangely, there are probably fewer of them today than there were in the late 80s or early 90s, um, proportionally. And secondly, there has been a shift among some of the religious towards religious nationalism. But these are not the Haredim. These are not the ultra-Orthodox. They're apolitical. All they care about is religion. And any government that supports their religious demands on the rest of society and for getting subsidies to study religion, they'll support. Uh, if people will give them virtually free housing in the occupied territories, they'll take it. Uh, they have large families. They need the space. They, need, they can't afford to live in overbuilt, expensive Tel Aviv or even Jerusalem. And so they're there in the territories where they occupy territories where they are, uh, essentially because it's cheap housing, or relatively cheap housing. And, you know, lots of space, and so on and so forth. They're not the problem. It's religious nationalists and right-wing nationalists. And the movement towards a sort of chauvinistic, extreme hard right nationalism in Israel uh, that is really the most disturbing phenomenon. And there's not that much to balance it. Um, I'm not an expert on Israel, but those things you can just get from reading the Israeli press. And that's the problem. It's not the ultra-Orthodox at all. Religious nationalists, the settler movement, is made up in part of extreme religious nationalists who are believers in the greater land of Israel philosophy, but they are also believers in the gun and in the fact that only Jews have rights in this land and that the Arabs are there on sufferance and that you know they should be treated accordingly. And again, in this movie that I just mentioned, uh, the law in these parts, they touch on settler violence only peripherally. Um, but the settlers are not subject to military law. The occupation doesn't affect them. The settlers are in the occupied territories as of by right as citizens of Israel under Israeli law. So even though Israel has not extended its law and has not annexed anything but Jerusalem of the occupied territories, uh, Israeli citizens in the occupied territories get to be judged by Israeli judges in Israeli courts under Israeli law, are treated by Israeli policemen in a fundamentally different fashion. So if you destroy Palestinian property, you're subject to one law. If you are, and you're an Israeli, if you destroy Israeli property, uh, you're judged under a completely different law, a military system, and you, 90, 90 odd percent of the people who are brought before those courts go to jail. Very few Israelis go to jail for damaging Palestinian property or even for killing Palestinians. So you have two completely different legal systems in the occupied territories, uh, and the and the settlers uh, are are firm believers that this is exactly the right way to go. This is their land as far as they're concerned. Uh, and that's the philosophy that Begin brought to, brought to power in 77 when he became prime minister. And that's what informs the regime that has been imposed on the Palestinians and that the Palestinian Authority is part of. Great. Please join me in thanking Rashid Khalidi for being with us tonight. <laughs>